Welcome to episode 17 of the ADV podcast. And today we're going to be talking about China's kidnap diplomacy. Why are you allowed to wear that hat? I didn't have mine on. I'm doing this on purpose because you keep going on about how bad the Raiders right, are. Right, but I don't have my Chargers hat. That's not fair. Doesn't matter. Some... Go Raiders! I don't even know what like a quarterback is, so... And I'm being absolutely serious. I'll give you a quarterback to take that. <laughs> I didn't give you a quarter in the first place. This is true. Yeah, anyway. Um, can you believe we're on 17 episodes? Isn't that nuts? It's crazy. Uh, this podcast has now been going for quite some time. Yeah, it feels like we just started it. And uh, today's podcast is actually a little bit different from the usual. Why don't yeah. you explain where you actually are? I'm actually in Boston right now. Isn't that weird? Because this is a live show. Yes. Hang on a second. Yeah, this might be a little confusing, uh, but here I am live. I'll prove it to you. I'll read something from the comments. Someone said, hello from Austria. It's midnight here. (laughs) So this is a little bit uh, of an unconventional episode. As you may have heard, Sea Milk is in Boston right now. So we did a little bit of a a pre-record on some of the segments. But I'm here to answer your questions live, all the super chats, and uh, obviously there's a lot to get through. So let's get back to the show, shall we? Yeah, um, just give it a second. Here it comes. So Ooh, now, now be, that you guys, be back. yeah, <laughs> now you guys know the secret. This is the first time that you can actually be like, oh, it's not live. Uh, yeah, I wanted to make sure that you didn't think they didn't think that's a real secret that we do every time. No, absolutely yeah. not. But um, we've kind of given it away. Like we can never get away with this now. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's why we're being upfront about it. Sure. Anyway, we're going to start out by, you know, talking about our first section, which is of course what's new, and this is where we talk about what's new in China and topics related to China. So, what's new in China? A lot, really. Um, I recently put out a video called um, "Western YouTubers pay- Paid by the Chinese Government to Attack Me," yeah. with a question mark. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually was holding the opinion. We did that video with no fuckers, remember? No. Oh, yeah. I don't know how to pronounce it. No like, fuckers. Uh, well, N of K or Z. Yeah, no fuckers. Yeah. Is that what it is? He says it in every video. Okay. Well, yeah, the Russian dude. He says, "What's up, lasers? No fuckers here." Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, right. yeah. Um, we did a really cool video with him. If you guys haven't seen it, go check that out. But um, it kind of inspired me to talk a little bit about something that had been happening to us. So in the last podcast, we brought up the fact that there were ads popping up on our videos targeting you. Mm-hmm. specifically um and it was like a beijing dude driving around in a car at night yeah and he was either physically shelling out money which i have a little bit of a hard time to believe because like sure. why would somebody make a really terrible boring video where half of it has no audio yeah and then put physical u.s dollars into an adwords campaign yeah targeting against you no it doesn't make sense it's a little weird right so we talked a little bit about that in his episode Mm-hmm. Um, and then in my episode, I didn't want to point fingers at anyone. I actually kind of wanted to dispel some of these ideas. I sure. didn't think there was any proof of this. If anything, these super big CCP shills, uh, the Western ones, these yeah. YouTubers, if anything, I was under the impression that they were doing it for clicks, right? Yeah. And indirectly, it's money, I right? personally think it's it's a mixture of they need clicks, and they also want to kind of make it very well known what side they stand on because mm-hmm. they're, they're concerned. And to be honest... When you are a foreigner in China, especially if you have any kind of like media presence, if you're, mm. if you're online, you have to make sure that if the government does find out about you or come across your videos, that they see you're on the right side. Sure. Because if you've got business there, if you've got family there, if you're working there, if you're living there, the last thing you want is to be jeopardized. You don't want the government to be like, look, this guy is one of those foreigners who's talking bad about China because then they'll deport you. It's mm. happened actually to some people we know. Yeah, yeah. They've lost sure. jobs and they've been deported because, you know, stuff they've done online. Right. So I think this whole like pro CCP agenda that a lot of these guys have, it's kind of like self-protection in a way. Mm. They want to make sure that uh, they're like, oh no, look, I'm positive about China. Don't kick me out. You right. I mean? the, my whole point was that I agree with you on that. And we were never of the opinion that there was something higher than that. Yeah. Uh, until um, we started seeing that a lot of them, actually the majority of them, started appearing on state media. Yes. And you've been on state media, so I want to quash this right away. You've been on CCTV. I've been right? on state media for years. For I've years. been in the local newspapers. I mean, I was in the Shenzhen Daily last time I counted about 14 right. times. 
Remember, like, I pulled all those articles out and we actually counted yeah. it? Yeah. So mm. being on state media means nothing. No. You've never shilled for the government. That's no. the difference. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they wouldn't even, they didn't promote your YouTube channel. They didn't no. do anything. But these other ones s- explicitly talk about their YouTube channels. Sure. And then all of them wound up with Chinese subtitles in their videos. Yeah, that's a... That's these a people sub- don't speak Chinese. Yeah, no, that's a sign. It's incredibly difficult. It takes longer to put subtitles into a video than it does to edit it. Mm. And especially if you can't speak, read, and write Chinese fluently, you need a team to do that for you. Right. Or a very dedicated fan base or something, because it's difficult. So we're Um, always going to be above this. We're never going to point people out. We're never going to start YouTube beef. We're never going to get in arguments with these people. But there was something a little bit interesting that you came across. Um, yeah, that well, we should probably just address because people are going to see it anyway. I think one thing that's actually very interesting about all of this is that all of a sudden, uh, a bunch of like very small YouTube channels in China, um, and I keep an eye on the China scene because I'm the first guy to ever do it, and people ask me advice, and I give advice. I'm very happy to help smaller channels. I do understand, especially these days, if people don't want to be associated with me. It doesn't sure. matter. Same. I still give advice because I yeah. know how difficult it is to film in China. I know how difficult it is to yeah, edit. Yeah, we're, we're and, still on all the WeChat groups when we help smaller YouTube. And how difficult it is to upload with right. the, the great firewall and all that. But I started to notice that all these like very small, um, relatively insignificant YouTube channels were all of a sudden starting to make videos with the exact same titles. Mm-hmm. You know, something like... Parks in China, mm. you know, are great. Type There's thing. like five of those. Yeah, okay. Then the next one was like, YouTube is unsubscribing people from me because right. I make yeah. pro-China content. Yeah. You know, that'll, that'll, and then we dispelled that. Yeah, no, that's nonsense because, you know, YouTube, it's for everyone. It's the same. People are unsubscribed from our channels all the time. ADV China, Serpents Today, Lao 86, doesn't I'm not matter. not blaming the CCP for that. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. But th- this is kind of a common thing. They, they're blaming YouTube for being racist against Chinese or something, you see. Mm. Um, But what you can do is you can go to all these like uh, channels that have this pro CCP message and you can see video titles that are almost the same, which is odd. Why would they all of a sudden do the exact same things? Mm. Unless there was some kind of a directive to do so or some kind of incentive to do so, right? Or they talked amongst themselves. Yeah, and they decided this is what we're going to do. Anyway, um, it turns out there's a small YouTuber. It's a guy who's, you know is in one of the groups that mm-hmm. we talk to and you know he's been around for a while his name's prime in china mm-hmm. and he's actually done a couple of uh, videos where he's actually found out some information to kind of back up some of our theories that mm-hmm. uh, these people are actually working with other people being paid directly or indirectly yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly and um just exposing a bit of the hypocrisy. So I wanted to give him a shout out, not to cause YouTube drama, by the way, but I think it's important for people to see that this this is a real thing that we were talking about. Well, I about. mean, if we believe in the morality of what we say yeah. and that the things that an authoritarian government are, that, that what they're doing is wrong, yeah. then it's kind of important to understand because there's probably a lot of people out there that might be quite confused mm-hmm. when they see a very differing opinion that yeah. goes against everything. They're like, wait, wait what? The CCP is awesome. It's great. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Everyone's racist against Chinese people. Exactly. So if there's any information out there that kind of leads people to actually see the bigger picture, I support that. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, I don't want to be tied to any of this. But if you guys are interested in like if you want to juicy out, YouTube drama yeah, go look at, go look <laughs> in at the video. insignificantly small China YouTuber scene, uh, please feel free to go check out Prime in China's channel. Agreed. Um, anyway, let's move on. Yes. It's now time for a couple of super chats. So I'm going to magically appear. So, yes, Super Chats. Before I get onto Super Chats, I actually wanted to talk about another thing that's new in China, simply because it's just come out in the news. And I think it's very important that we talk about this. You know, there's a university in China, it's one of the biggest ones, Fudan University, and it's incredibly prestigious. And they have a charter, you know, kind of like a constitution. And um, let's see, they've changed their charter. It was announced by the Ministry of Education. And they've taken a big part of the charter out. Freedom of thought was in the charter. And that's been erased. So it's been erased and it's been replaced with arming the minds of teachers and students with Xi Jinping's new era of socialist ideology with Chinese characteristics. And it also obliges uh, faculty and students to adhere to core socialist values and build a harmonious campus environment. This is what's happening right now in China. They're removing wording like freedom of thought and uh, they removed something else about um, uh, expression or something of the, out of their charter. You can read up on it. It's pretty big news. 
But the fact that they're replacing it with Xi Jinping thought and core socialist values just shows you how ridiculous this whole situation is. You've basically got um, a university telling you that you must now learn the musings of a dictator. And uh, if you wanted to put that into perspective, just imagine um, Harvard University all of a sudden said that there's no more freedom of speech. Instead, we must study the, um, the five ideas of Hillary Clinton or something like that and core de democratic values, some nonsense like that. It's, it's quite ridiculous. If you actually step back and look at it, it's, um, it's incredibly worrying because this is the kind of thing that happened with Mao Zedong and uh, the cultural devolution and the Great Leap Backwards. It's all about you have to adhere to what this one man thinks and this one man says you must worship him and uh, you're no longer allowed to have, you know, sort of freedom of expression. So let's keep an eye on this kind of thing because it's starting to ramp up a lot in China. But this is supposed to be Super Chats for What's News, so let's get on to those. Um, going to start with the first one. So, were you planning to go to India? Yes, we are planning to go to India. That is a 2020 goal, and we'll keep you up to date on that one. Next, um, sorry, that was from Mastiff Jada. Humanity never learns. What would happen if Xi Jinping mocked Mao? Uh, Xi Jinping is not allowed to mock Mao because his entire existence is based on the validity of what Mao Zedong started and what Mao Zedong did, which is the Communist Party, the CCP. And... Uh, I firmly believe that the majority of the CCP wish that Mao Zedong could disappear and just kind of not be a thing anymore. But because he's such a big part of the rhetoric of the building of China and all that, they can't get rid of him. They have to sort of begrudgingly keeping him, keep him around like a, an undead zombie, you know? I love this mug. Okay, <clears throat> next. Uh, from from Josema Fernandez Barreras. Merry Christmas, Feliz Navidad. Hope to see a special video of you two singing Christmas songs. Well, <laughs> maybe we can organize that for you. We'll, we'll see. Um, uh, another guy. What happened to DM? I miss his presence. Uh, DM has uh, moved out of the country for work, basically. So he's off to greener pastures. And uh, he, was, he was here to help us out in the beginning. And uh, it was nice to have him here. But he's, uh, you know, we'll, he'll probably make another guest appearance at some time in the future. Um, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Lichtmichen, yeah, I don't need to repeat that, but uh, every Brit can be bribed with a cup of tea. Well, absolutely. Agreed. All right, um, I'm going to do one more super chat and then we've got to move on with the show. So, Austin Ray, uh, greetings from the Ohio State University. One of my students who is Mongolian showed me your channels and I'm addicted to them. What do you guys think about Mongolia in relation to China? Uh, Seamilk did a very good video on the the Mongolian issue. You should go to look at his channel. You'll see there's a picture of like a, a Mongolian looking woman with some barbed wire. Um, and uh, he talks about the whole Mongolia issue. Definitely worth a look. Anyway, guys, we have to get back to the show. So um, if you don't mind, I'm going to call Seamilk back and let's continue. We're back. Those, you did a great job with those questions. I know. There's some seriously interesting questions. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, okay, so <laughs> now it's obviously going to be our next section, which is the main section of our show, which is Soft Power Hour. And this is where we talk about how the Chinese government is using wily little ways and so on to change your ideas of China. Yes. Okay. Just making sure that's... <laughs> okay. I thought it was muted. So. Oh, no, no, it's not. Okay, so... We've got a big, very serious topic to talk about. This one hits close to home. Yeah. Now, you know, recently they built this massive bridge between Hong Kong and Macau. I mean, mm. I remember them talking about this for years and years and years, and I remember seeing it on the TV, you know. Um, Got to throw in a little tidbit. If you don't know what Macau is, yeah. it's an ex-Portuguese territory handed back to China in 1999. Mm. They didn't have the same basic rule of law carried over that Hong Kong had. Much freer than China. Mm. You can still have unfiltered internet. Yeah, you there. go there, you've got like Christians coming out and giving you pamphlets on the street. And, yeah, you know, the, the problem is Macau is a massively rich hub for money laundering for mainlanders. Yes, yes. So ha the mainland government has a ton of influence. Uh, absolutely. But relatively yeah. free. Well, I'd, I'd like to liken Macau to Hong Kong in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Because it borders mainland China. Yeah. Um, it's on the border of Zhuhai. 
and uh, I've gone to Zhuhai many times, and mm-hmm. you can walk over the border mm-hmm. into Macau. It's a very similar setup to walking into Hong Kong. You so go, it's identical. Yeah, you go through a border checkpoint, you get a stamp in your passport, yeah. they give you like a, for most most nationalities, get like a free visa for 30 days or mm, whatever 90 days. it is, 90 mm-hmm. days for some. Uh, probably for South Africans, it's like five days. Or <laughs> they always give us discount days. <laughs> anyway, so you walk in there, and it's it's quite an incredible place. It's tiny. Mm-hmm. It's like you can go around the whole city on foot in a day. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's tiny. But um, it's the Las, Las Vegas of Asia. Mm-hmm. It's like the gambling hub, mm-hmm. you know, port of Macau. Gambling hub, of, <laughs> you know, South Asia. Anyway, yeah. no, seriously, it is massive it's got casinos everywhere it's very rich mm. it's got a lot of european history there mm. so you got interesting foods it's, it's, it's a cool place you maybe know. lived there for seven years so i was there at least two times a month yeah you've been there a lot, more a lot than me, yeah. yeah i've, I've only been it. to macau like five times or something so we digress yes now the interesting thing about macau is that hong kong people go there all the time in fact so much so that you can spend Hong Kong dollars mm-hmm. in Macau. You don't need to and do money indeed. exchange. Yeah, you don't need, there's no money exchange necessary. You go into a casino, a hotel, street vendor, you can use Hong Kong dollars to buy anything. Mm-hmm. It's, it's you know what's funny though is that right. Macau people love it because mainlanders would be too lazy to change money because right. a lot of them don't speak Cantonese. Right. Macau, Macanese people speak Cantonese. Yeah, it's Cantonese like Hong Kong. So, yeah, so they'll go there with like buttloads of RMB. And the RMB is stronger than the, the Macanese peseta. Right. But it's like, you know, like nine nine pesetas to one dollar versus like six RMB to one dollar, right? Right. So they'll just spend it, but it's still one to one for them. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's awesome. They make a make a bonus. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it was like that in Shenzhen in the beginning. Mm. When you took over Hong Kong dollars, they would accept it one to one because the Hong Kong dollar was stronger. stronger when the I time, got there, yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, we digress. You get too much digression. Basically, what happens is, it's incredibly common because gambling is illegal in Hong Kong. Right? Mm-hmm. So, unless Several you do the horse, horse racing, yeah. it's kind of weird. It's such a British thing. It's re- <laughs> really weird. Um, anyway, people will just pop over to, to Macau. You can take a ferry. Mm-hmm. Or a hydrofoil. Yeah, which, by the way, I would from now on suggest you take a ferry. Okay. We'll tell you why. Yeah. So, you can take a ferry to pop over there, do your gambling, and you pop back home. And for Hong Kong people, they've got the ID card. They can just go through. There's no signing of papers. There's no nonsense. It's like And instant. keep in mind, there's a, lot, a huge percentage of Hong Kong people that do not like to go to mainland China. Yes. You know, we often confuse that because we went back and forth all the time. Yeah. But a lot of Hong Kong people don't dare to go I, to I mean, China. yeah, my, my ex-wife, uh, the Hong Kong, you know, citizen, she had never been back to mainland China mm-hmm. until she met me. Like, mm-hmm. she'd never been, even though her family's from there. Right. She had never been in mm-hmm. there. You know, it's one of those things that they think it's too dangerous. Right. So the closest a lot of foreign people. territory for them is Macau. Yeah. Place. So anyway, uh, it's very easy to go in the back. So this is what happened. The guy's like, okay, I'm going to go over to Macau for my, like, weekend gambling or whatever he's going to do. Hops on a bus and he's going to take the... Hong um, Kong bus. Yeah, Hong Kong bus. And they've got that new bridge that goes between Hong Kong and, and Macau, which is awesome. It's like, mm-hmm. a, it's an engineering marvel. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hops on the bus. There's a little artificial island in the middle, which kind of like helps support. support it or yeah. whatever. <laughs> and unbeknownst to everybody, that little artificial island is actually Chinese, mainland Chinese territory. So what they did is they set up a roadblock on that little artificial island in the middle of the bridge forced everybody to get off the bus, checked all their papers, scanned their faces and, you know, put them into like Use the system. Laws. Yeah. And they arrested this guy because they accused him of doing some like cell phone smuggling or something back in 2012. So he just disappeared. And it took eight. This is how China works. Someone disappears. It takes ages before anyone figures out what the hell's mm-hmm. going on. Mm-hmm. It can take weeks before there's any kind of statement to say, oh, he was arrested because he was a criminal. It could be longer than that. Yeah. I mean, we see this with the booksellers that yeah. disappeared. And what, they might appear later, like, confessing on TV, saying, like, oh, I'm so bad or whatever. North Korea style. Yeah, well, like, in last week when we showed the guy the, who made that WeChat post against the cops. Yeah, the it's, motorcycle. Yeah, thing. it's kind of like a dude in a chair will be like, I made right. a mistake. Anyway, that's scary. Okay, don't take that bridge. And it also shows you there's a lot. This absolutely ratifies this whole uh, idea of the protests in Hong Kong. Mm. Because they were protesting against an extradition bill, which would have allowed this kind of thing to happen on Hong Kong soil. Yeah, I mean, think of how many people could have been snatched off. Just like, oh, yeah, you, 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 you. Let's get <laughs> this them This guy off. was on a goddamn bus. Yeah. I mean, he was literally in a goddamn bus. Yeah, just imagine how scary that is because you have no control. If, for whatever reason, mainland China decides you're a dissident or, you know, there's something wrong with you or they can, they can absolutely, the CCP can 
absolutely accuse you of committing some random crime, saying, oh, you are a spy or you have upset the harmony, social harmony of China. And all they need to do is keep an eye out for you. Oh, he, we know he likes to go to Macau. OK, he's probably going to be going. So let's just check everyone as they go through. You go over that little island. You can be nabbed. Like randomly, anyone can be nabbed. Let me throw a little personal detail sure. in here. Sure, sure. We, if the CCP was like, we're not happy right now with what they're doing on YouTube, right? Mm. And we, we can freely go to Macau and Hong Kong, no problem. Yeah. Right? We do. Yeah. Often. Now, we go on that bus. You better fucking believe <laughs> that they're looking for sure. us on that island. Yeah, no, for sure. You know. It's, it's actually, it's scary. Yeah. And this is something the rest of the world needs to know. You can take sides with the CCP if you want. You can take sides with China, and you, or you can take sides with Hong Kong, or whatever it is. Like mm. it doesn't actually matter. What really matters is this lack of rule of law, this lack of fairness that, that comes out of the CCP. They can, and there are plenty of examples. It's not like we're just saying this. There's so many examples of when the CCP doesn't like someone, wants to shut someone up. Or, you know, they just think someone's unhealthy for the society or something. They can just go and arrest them, okay? They can bust into your apartment. There's no such thing as needing a search warrant. There's no such thing as, like, a fair trial or anything. We know that. It's just about grab them, shut them up, okay? So if they have the power to extradite people from any country, they will. If there's someone saying, like, oh, free Tibet, they will just grab them and go, mm -hmm. all right? So this is, once again given us a very clear, crystal clear example of what would have happened in Hong Kong if that extradition bill had gone through. Isn't it terrifying? Yeah, because it's happening on that little man-made island That's in between Hong Kong and Macau. This is a physical example that means something. Because before, it's just a piece of paper, right? Yeah. And they can make all these bullshit excuses about, no, these are the statute of limitations. Like, no, you have to have a crime that you could be punished in mainland China by seven years. Mm. Blah, 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 blah. It doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. That it can just be matter. made up. It could just be made up. Dude, they're right? already kidnapping people in, in Hong Kong anyway. Sure. You know, this, they just want to legitimize it. Absolutely. So it's less annoying. So, yeah, I mean, guys. That's a major update. This, this is really important. Please, anyone who's on the fence as to, you know, what's going on in, in Hong Kong, look at these kind of examples and just realize how scary that is. Mm -hmm. How scary that is to anyone. Mm. Anyone who has a free idea that doesn't agree with the CCP. Anyone who says that Xi Jinping is not a good leader and who criticizes him could be a target of just being snatched up like that. Yeah. It's easy to make charges. It's easy to say that they've done random things because China does have a lot of arbitrary laws. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally, that guy who was arrested for insulting the police, mm -hmm. it was like because he's destabilized. Yeah. public order or something. Yeah, it's just make, even mean? make up some crap like that just because you don't like a guy. Okay. Anyway. I mean, they, when they jail people like for calling out the fake vaccines and stuff. Yeah. It's like, are you kidding me? Exactly. You know, disturbing public order. Yeah. Environmental no. activists disturbing public order. Well, that guy who photoshopped a snake. Yeah, disturbing public order. Yeah, it's like oh, creating, you're, you're creating rumors. Yeah, cre <laughs> you can be a, you can be arrested for, for creating, creating rumors, rumors yes. in China. Yeah. All right. And who's to say if you didn't make a joke and it became a rumor or whatever? It's it's dangerous territory, and a lot of these these uh pro-CCP guys don't seem to understand just how ridiculously bad that is. Mm. Doesn't matter where you come, yeah, where, doesn't matter where you're from. You have to agree that that's a very bad idea. Yes. Yeah. Good. All right, cool. Yeah, so that's uh, the kidnap diplomacy we're kind of talking about here is the fact that they can just grab you when it suits them. And we have seen that before we wrap up with uh, what happened in Canada mm. when they arrested the CFO. And mm. then straight away, they went after some Canadians and arrested them like eight days later. And uh, it's happened before with another couple up there on, mm. on the border that used to run yeah, a coffee Dan, shop. Dan, Dan, Dan Dong, Dong, yeah. Board of Dan Dong. <laughs> uh, and it happens a lot. Whenever there's some kind of like thing with the American trade deals and mm -hmm. stuff, all of a sudden you'll start to see foreigners being arrested for like random things. And if you don't care about human rights mm. or other countries or you just mm. think Chinese people are whatever, it has nothing to do with you, mm. you should at least care with about how insane that is yeah. and how fickle that is and how dangerous that that's, is. That's not just a random thing again that I'm saying. No. You know, you see those signs up that are like, American citizens will pay 25% right, extra right. At, the, at my restaurant or in this hotel. I mean, that's shitty, it's, but like, it, it's, it's worse. Yeah, it's it's shitty and that puts that, that kind of... um vengeful thought justification yeah, as well. in, into society right. right 
And then uh, all of a sudden the cops are cracking down on foreign teachers in the bar, mm. giving them spot tests and urine tests and hair follicle tests and stuff, trying to find them. And if they right. find an American who's like, then they'll jump up, jump up and down with glee to say, look at this evil American who does drugs he's in an, our country. Yeah, he's or, a CIA agent. Yeah, CIA agent. Anyway, yeah, yeah, we dragged this on. It's time for some super chats. So guess what? Yep. Yeah, okay. Time for some super chats. <clears throat> Before I do that, though, I do want to add on to what we've just been talking about there. And um, I think probably the scariest part of being whisked away by the Chinese government is the opacity. You see, I think a lot of people who have grown up in, in a Western society and, uh, you know, in, in a normal country where there's rule of law, you're used to the idea that if you get arrested... You will be able to make a phone call to tell your family or a lawyer or whatever what's going on. Also, if your family wants to find out what's going on, they can just go to the police station and be like, hey, have you arrested XYZ today? And uh, find out from the cops, yes, they've been arrested and they'll tell you why. He's been arrested for attempted murder or he's been arrested for drugs or whatever. There's always, you can find out the reason. But very often, in fact, a lot of the times in China when someone's just whisked away, there's no explanation and people can't find out where they are and they don't know what's happened to them. And I say this from experience because I know actual foreigners who've been arrested in China for various different reasons. Um, you know, people that you hear about or people that you know personally that just kind of suddenly disappear and you're like, where is this guy? And you'll hear through the grapevine that, uh, oh, they got taken away by the cops from this bar on whatever time. or the school was raided that they were teaching in and uh, the cops took them away. And then it's like, well, where the hell are they? You know, what's going on? Have they been charged with anything? You know, is, are they okay? What, what's, what's happening? And sometimes weeks later, you, you might hear something, but you only hear it from them. They'll send you like a WeChat message. Oh, I've just been released. I'm on the plane being deported back to England or whatever. This happened to a guy that I knew um, not that long ago. He just disappeared, and no matter what we did, we couldn't find out where he was or what was going on. It turns out he was in one of those um, WeChat groups with other foreigners. Now, he wasn't even a guy that was arrested. What had happened was they'd gone to a bar. They'd arrested a bunch of foreigners. Well, they, what they do is they force urine tests. And please remember, in China, they don't need a warrant. They can search you. They can do what they want. They can come into your apartment and search your apartment. There is no sort of uh, law that prevents them from doing that. So they took a bunch of urine samples, found a bunch of uh, the foreigners that they did. The urine samples were positive for marijuana and you know various other drugs. Took them down to the police station, went through their phones, found the WeChat group where all these uh, foreigners were like talking about scoring weed and stuff. And they went through everyone in that list. And this guy's name was in there. So they actually tracked him down and they came to his house and they arrested him at his house. Took him for a test. Unfortunately for him, he was positive. Um, and he last joint he smoked was like three weeks before, but they did the hair follicle test and uh, he tested positive. They then sent him off for like a, I think it was a, a two week rehab thing where it's just like they take you basically to, to jail and you get to do various things and stay in a jail cell with a bunch of people and then they sent him to like prison prison for a, a while later and then they finally deported him and it was only when he was deported and on the plane about to leave that they gave him his phone back and stuff and so he actually sent a message to me telling me what had gone on but you know up until that point nobody knew where the guy was nobody knew what was going on and this is the scariest part is you could be picked up for whatever reason Big or small, it could be mis a mistake, you don't know. And uh, your family doesn't know how to get a hold of you. Your friends don't know how to get a hold of you. And uh, that's that's kind of what I'm going for here. And I think a lot of the times when they arrest someone, they arrest them for whatever reason, maybe because like with the whole Canadian thing, you know, one of the two high profile Canadians is a personal friend of Seamilk and myself. Um, when he was arrested, I feel like, Nobody, well, nobody knew for a long time until, you know, they hadn't pressed any formal charges. We didn't know what was going on with the guy. I think they're just like thinking, all right, so we got the guy. What are we going to charge him with? 
You know, I feel like it's an afterthought. So you only ever find out what the guy is charged with when the government decides what they're going to charge him with or decides how to play their sort of uh, chess game, their tit-for-tat retaliation stuff. Anyway, sorry, back to the Super Chats. Let's see what we got. We have from Dion Chapman. Hope to ride together someday, guys, and Prozzy, if he's around watching now. Yes, absolutely. That'd be fun. We've been thinking for a long time about uh, doing a kind of a ride where we ride, uh, you know, our motorcycles through in various states here in uh, the U.S. Meet up with a bunch of people, you know, that kind of thing. It's on the cards. Uh, let's move on. Okay. <clears throat> Winston, are Chinese doctors able to easily practice in America if they move there? Do they have to go back to school in the West? Um, you know, a, a Chinese doctor, the education is vastly different to uh, doctors in America or the UK. So if they wanted to study as a doctor, they would have to start from scratch, basically. Um, I know because, you know, my wife's a doctor in China, but she wouldn't be able to practice in the West. At the very most, she would be able to study more and become a nurse practitioner fairly easily. But an actual doctor, no, they'd have to do the whole seven year stint and all that internship and all that stuff, basically. So, all right, next. <clears throat> Do you think Seamilk will step over the line and have people turn on them? What do you think Seamilk will turn on them? I mean, at some point, is there a breaking point? I don't really understand turn on them. Do you mean, um, oh, do you think China? I read it as Seamilk, sorry. <sighs> okay, do you think China will step over the line? I think China has stepped over a line um, recently. They They really are starting to piss people off, you know with the human rights violations and the South China Sea stuff and the trade war. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that they've been they've been playing a lot of bad hands recently. And I think it is changing uh, opinion against China. And the way that China retaliates against this changing opinion is just basically digging the grave further. And I hate to I hate to see it. By the way, when saying China, please don't mix it up. We mean the CCP. China as a people, Chinese people, is a different story. But China as the ruling government, um, yeah, they've they've made a lot of bad bad choices recently, and uh, it's coming to light. And I think the world's opinion is changing because it's not getting better; it's getting worse. All right, let's see what's next. Beer money for when you guys are working on the new car. Hey, thanks, mate. Speaking of cars, our new channel, Worthless Whips. Look it up. Just. Uh, you know, search Worthless Whips on YouTube. Um, we've got our channel ad up there. And for those of you who are a patron um, of Worthless Whips or myself or Seamilk, we'll, we'll have already received an early preview link to the first episode. And uh, that will be released to the public as soon as we've managed to figure out how to monetize the channel. It needs a certain amount of watch hours and so on. So if you guys feel charitable, you can head over to the Worthless Whips uh, channel and just kind of, I don't know, there's a playlist of uploads. Just play them in the background for us. Get us some some hours on there so we can uh, sort this out. Um, those are, by, by the way, the, the content that's up there at the moment is Q&A, kind of like what I'm doing now, Super Chat stuff that's been cut out of the personal live streams that Seamilk and myself usually do. Let's get on to the next one. Love you guys. We'll watch later. Bad Wi-Fi. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Hope you get to see it later. Um, Okay, what would it take for the Chinese people to understand that there's a difference between nation and government? Well, you see, the government, the CCP, has been working so hard for so many years to make people not realize that there's a difference between nation and government. Um, and it works in their favor incredibly well. And to the point that if you say anything bad about the Chinese government, um, the average Chinese person will feel personally insulted as if you've insulted their country and not their government. You see, it's very different to in the West where you can openly criticize your president or your government, but still love the country. In China, you're not allowed to love the country without loving the CCP, basically. As you can see behind me, <laughs> they're bringing back this communist era, Soviet nonsense. And uh, I think the Chinese people themselves don't realize that all this communist crap is a Western idea. They feel like it's chi Chinese, you know, that it's a Chinese thing. They don't realize that it's just another IP theft of Karl Marx. Anyway, let's move on. Um, 
Okay, Ooh, sorry, I've lost. Okay, there we go. Um, the same rules China imposes on Western companies and citizens should be placed on Chinese companies and citizens in the West. While I agree to a certain extent, I don't think that's correct because the way that China teaches, no, sorry, China treats foreigners is awful. The Chinese government again. You are constantly being discriminated against and treated as an outsider. You cannot integrate. There's no path to properly integrate into Chinese society. And the constant rhetoric in the news and everywhere else is like the West versus China. They don't even discriminate against different Western countries. Like foreigners are foreigners. It doesn't matter if you're from Scandinavia or if you're from Australia or wherever. Um, if you're not Chinese, you're just a foreigner. It's like a blanket term. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult situation to talk about. But if we were to start in the West treating Chinese citizens in the same way, I think it would be monstrous. Imagine we wouldn't allow Chinese citizens to stay in hotels in Australia or America or Sweden. You know, this is killing. Just imagine. Um, it, it would be outrageous because that happens in China. Me as a foreigner, sea milk as a foreigner, all of us walk into a hotel and they're like, sorry, no foreigners allowed. And uh, this has happened countless times when we're in the rural areas. Just imagine a Chinese person walking into a hotel in, in New York and they're like, sorry, no Chinese allowed. It would be ridiculous. Um, and, you know, not being able to buy property or start businesses without a joint partner or not being able to do X, Y, Z. The thing that I can say about the West that's fantastic is that Chinese citizens that come to visit the West, whether they be tourists or if they come to immigrate, are treated equally as if they were a citizen. There's no special treatment, you know, whether it be positive or negative against them, you know, by law. Whereas in China, by law, foreigners are treated in a special way, negatively and positively, which is not correct. So I think, um, at least from a moral standpoint, the way the West treats Chinese citizens is good. And the way that uh, China treats, you know, foreigners like myself is bad. Anyway, let's move on. Um, would you guys consider going to SCMM 2020? I don't even know what that is. Um, SCMM? Sorry, man, don't, I, I don't know what that is. But uh, if it's something cool, then we'd consider it for sure. Uh, okay, next one. <clears throat> sea Milk, don't turn on us. Happy holiday, guys. And nice skill, Sea Milk, secretly chatting in the video and in chat without your hands moving. Yeah, if you haven't figured it out by now, right now this is live. <laughs> and uh, Sea Milk and I have a bit of pre-recorded stuff in the background. Anyway, be f it's, it's time for us to continue with the show. I'll get to the rest of the, the questions in the next Super Chat. So are you guys ready? Let's head back to... Seamilk and myself. Seamilk, where are you? Come on. Okay, so now it's time for our next se segment. As we all know, it is Guanxi Corner, and this That's is where correct. we talk about relationships and things that have to do with uh, business or personal. Who knows? Uh, so what do we got this week, Seamilk? Put, put on my reading glasses. Here. Okay. It's actually the opposite. I'm actually short-sighted. All right, Guanxi Corner. Yeah. Hello. I was wondering if there was a way I could find someone while I met when I was in... I'm going to blank out the city just to... You know, okay. In this city in China in 2008... Mm -hmm. I know her name, but I cannot read or speak Mandarin. Bro. No. <laughs> hey, this is this is pretty common. Um, yeah, I mean... I've actually had quite a few requests for me to check up on or... I do this all the time. Yeah. It's like a second job for me. Uh, you know, people will often be like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of dating this girl mm -hmm. online. This is her name. Yeah. yeah, can you see if she's real? And then they'll it's give... It's usually pretty easy. They'll, they'll give the actual name and the city they're in. How the hell am I supposed to go and find someone in a city? Do you understand how many people live in the cities in China? You know, Shenzhen's like 20 million people Wait, or something. Wait, so we're supposed to find, find this girl. He has a name. And he has the city. He doesn't have her name. Wait, really? No, he says, I know her name. Oh, I know her name. But okay. I cannot speak or read Oh, so he doesn't know how to actually articulate that name. And he doesn't know how to probably write it in Chinese. Mm. So it's just like saying like... Way wrong or something, you know, like with some random. You're way wrong. Yeah, you're way wrong, you know. <laughs> yeah, Shao, I'm sorry, Shao dude. Pang Pang. I, I don't mean to be a dick, but that's, that's. It's it's stupid. Like, come on, dude. Like, imagine I said, 
I need to find um, somebody in in New York. You know, his name is Dave. like Joseph Leibovitz. Right. Okay, and that's it. I know he lives in New York. I met him 15 years yeah, ago. Yeah, he lives in New York State. Can you can you help me find him? No. <laughs> Sorry. What the hell? <laughs> that's interesting. I, I, the reason that I chose that was because we, we get those requests all yeah. the time. No, and, and we're willing to help. We're, we're poking a bit of fun here, but it's actually it's it's a lot more difficult to find someone in China than mm. it is in the West. There are no phone books or no. like, you know, directories or Facebook to look people no. up on and stuff. It's no, literally just... A lot of people just, have the same name. Yeah. Um, the same Chinese characters as the, the yeah. surname and stuff. So it's kind of really freaking difficult to find yeah. someone. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. Cool. Okay, so... Let's some super chats. Yeah, let's get some super chats out the way. Back for some more super chats. Guys, um, there's a, a question here from OZ Baby. He says, I remember you used to say you would never talk about the politics in China, so you must be feeling the impact yourself. Or what has changed? Much love. Well, get ready for a little bit of a monologue over here, guys. <laughs> when I first started making my videos on YouTube in China, um, it, things were changing, obviously. In fact, when I first uploaded my first videos, YouTube wasn't even blocked yet in China. Then a couple of months actually after I um, started uploading videos, it was blocked and then Facebook was blocked and then things started to go downhill as far as censorship, etc., is concerned. And I knew always that I was taking a risk because when you're engaging in something that the government obviously doesn't want you to do, in other words, upload to Facebook and share things on Facebook, because why else would they block it if they didn't, you know, if they wanted people to do that, they wouldn't block it. Um, you have to be cautious. So I was in a gray area. There's a reason why I'm the first person to ever make YouTube videos out of mainland China is because I took a massive risk. It's not like there weren't other foreigners there with cameras. It was just a keep your head down sort of an idea. Don't put your neck out because if you do, uh, you might just get your head chopped off type idea. So I kind of took a massive risk by putting videos up and I just kept doing it. Um, and I realized that, well, I had tons of proof, but I realized that I was being watched because I would get contacted by, like I said, the newspapers and things like that. They would ask me to, you know, come and do an interview. And these were sort of government run. Every, remember, all media in China is government run. There's no private media. It all has to answer to the government. Everything needs to be ratified and censored and stuff. So I was even, I mean, there's even an article from 2000, 2008, I believe, on the Shenzhen government website about me back then about my videos and like bear in mind I was very small at the time. So I know that I'm being watched first of all by the government. <clears throat> and uh, second of all, I'm kind of doing something that I'm not supposed to be doing. So I realized very early on that I should stay out of politics because the quickest way for you to get yourself in trouble in China is to talk about politics. So when people would ask me politically charged questions in my comment sections, it used to really piss me off because I used to think, don't these people understand what position they're putting me in? Because if people are asking me about like Tibet and, uh, you know, human rights atrocities and organ, organ harvesting and all this kind of crap in my videos where I'm talking about eating a, a steamed bun or something, it puts a target on my back. Because then the government would see my YouTube channel as a platform for um, sort of dissidents or a platform for uh, free Tibet stuff or a platform for the Falun Gong or whatever it is. And that immediately is incredibly dangerous and put my livelihood at risk. So that's why I was very adamantly against any kind of political discussion on my channel. And as time went by, the positives were always used to outweigh the negatives in China for me. I would turn a blind eye or make excuses for some of the bad behavior that I witnessed in China. Because you do. You do witness bad behavior every single day in China. And you can blame it on the large population and you can say that, uh, you know, um, the majority of people are good, but because it's such a huge population, you know, just 1% a, a is like a couple of million people, right? But it wears on you because for every... Every good person that you come across during the day, there'll be 10 or at least another one person doing something crappy like 
throwing throwing some trash on the ground or spitting or or doing something nasty or trying to rip you off. Um, so it's a constant battle between sort of like, oh, I love China. Chinese people are so great. Or, oh, man, China is so backwards and th these people are disgusting. You know, you feel that way when you see the kind of behavior just on the streets. You'll see, uh, you know, a mother or grandmother allowing their child to take a dump on the road right in front of you or, or whatever it is. And you're like, what the hell? Is there no civilization here? Then at the same time, you get treated incredibly well by somebody who just snaps you out of it and you're like that's why i love china right so it's kind of like an up and down roller coaster the whole time um so for me especially in the beginning and before all these clampdowns and i can squarely say that it was around 2012 that i started to feel things go downhill and it's definitely related to xi jinping and uh, his government um I was incredibly happy. And so, you know, these things that I would witness, like the prostitution and the gambling and the and all the other bigger gangs and things that really pissed me off, I would stay away from anything that could potentially make China look bad in any way, because I was incredibly grateful for the opportunities that China had given me and uh, for my lifestyle. I didn't want to jeopardize my lifestyle in China. So as things got worse, I found it harder and harder to make excuses for the bad behavior. And I always tried to keep it as civil and uh, neutral as possible. I still do to the best of my ability. But it was after um, this huge campaign to attack me and uh, attack my family that I changed my mind. You know, I can quite easily separate the nationalist 50 cent trolls from the general populace in China. And I can say that, you know, all the Chinese friends I have, the, the casual people I meet on the streets, etc., they are not these horrible, vindictive um, cowards who would go after a person's family. Um, and when I say family, I mean they went after my parents, they went after my distant cousins, random people I'd never met that just share my surname. Um, all in a bid to harass them, to try and get them fired, to try and get them into trouble with the police, to do all these things. When this happened, it changed my mind. And the reason it changed my mind is nothing was ever said against it. So when these guys attack and do these disgusting things, like go and dox people and harass people and, and what have you, you never see any anyone from the government or any kind of statement from anyone to say, you know, hey, what they're doing is wrong. I mean, that's not fair. On my comment section on some of my videos, there are reasonable Chinese people who, you know, are saying, look, these guys suck. They're just keyboard warriors. And those are the, the good guys, obviously. But I'm saying from an official sort of perspective, when these guys go out and attack, um, you know, and tear down Lenin walls, and when you've got a Hong Kong, you know, protesting protest a thing going on in a, a university or something they go there and they attack them and they tear down their signs and do all this stuff you never see the chinese government saying that's bad you shouldn't be assaulting people and breaking the law in a foreign country all they ever say is like well done you know and at the very most they'll say oh they were just a little bit too patriotic you know but they their heart was in the right place so what you're seeing here is you're seeing a government that condones this kind of bad behavior this cowardly low down disgusting behavior of these ultra nationalists they condone it and they encourage it by not speaking against it and that's what really changed my mind when they attacked my family i was like you know what gloves off I am not going to make excuses for the bad behavior and the societal ills that I've been witnessing over the last 14 years. You know, I dedicate a lot, a lot of my life to China. I contributed a lot of myself to China. Um, and even just by spending all my money there and paying my taxes there and, you know, trying to show the rest of the world what China's really like, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I've done. There's a lot of stuff I don't talk about, like um, uh, something that Seamilk and I have been doing for a very long time is contributing to, you know, charity for, you know, uh, rural kids who don't have proper education in China and stuff. This is stuff that we do. We don't talk about it. We're not, we're not out there to brag. But China's always been a very big thing 
um, a big part of my life, Seamok's life, etc. And uh, that's why we marry Chinese citizens. We've got Chinese family, you know, um, uncles and mother-in-law, father-in-law, aunts and cousins and so on. It's a huge part of our lives. And then to see these disgusting, cowardly people attacking our families and then the, the government pretty much condoning it um, made me think, you know what? Uh, it's time. It's time to talk politics because it's politics that are driving this terrible behavior. So that's why my attitude has changed. I hope some people can understand and also understand at the same time that I'm not out now to just try and find fault or try and attack. I'm out to just share my experiences and uh, good or bad, I'm going to share them. So the more bad that happens, the more those are going to be shared. The more good that happens, the more that'll be shared too. Anyway, let's move on to the next question. Sorry for the monologue. Seamilk's not here to keep me in check. <laughs> okay. Someone, uh, Jeremiah Johnson said, what are some nonviolent paths the West can take to contain China's influence or even change the way China's run eventually? Seems they have a uh, long game sorted out. Any thoughts on, uh, also thoughts on Harleys? I think, look, What's been going on with the, the trade war, uh, things like that, I think are the, that's the right approach. Stop allowing China to take advantage of, you know, certain situations is the best way to do it. Just make things fair, bring things onto a fair playing field and um, things will fall into place because the, the world has been naive, honestly, when it comes to dealing with China um, and treating China as if they're benevolent and... Um, you know, uh, a kind force, but they're not. Uh, China, it, you know, the Chinese government, they believe that they're the supreme leaders of the world. They think Chinese people are racially superior than other races. It's very common to find that sort of thing, you know. Um, Zhongguo means the central kingdom. It's all about uh, we are the center of the universe and everyone else sucks and they've taken advantage of us for 200 years or something of humiliation and we've got the longest history and all this crap and it's our time and I think the rest of the world doesn't realize that that's the driving force happening at the moment. I think people need to wake up and see that it's not just kung fu and tea ceremony, you know. Um, we need to treat China equally and stop handling them with kid gloves and worrying about hurting the feelings of the Chinese people and like, oh, I'm so sorry we didn't put those nine dashes on a map. You know, um, and that's what's going to fix things. Anyway, Harleys, I mean, they're very American. I'll put you that way, uh, put it that way. I personally, um, I think they're great for like a long cruise. I wouldn't own one myself, but uh, I've got nothing against them. Okay, if this is live, put the keyboard on your head. Okay, fine. Here we go. Happy? <laughs> I, this is probably the first time I've ever put a keyboard on my head. Um, okay. Um, long time listener, uh, the first time donating, will Sasha be doing more cooking videos? I'm surprisingly good at cooking crack noodles. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Don't forget she's just had a kid. We just had a kid, so she's recovering and hopefully uh, she'll be back in the swing of things with her videos soon. Both of us are suffering from massive sleep deprivation. You know, I, um, <laughs> I can't tell you just how challenging it is to deal with that and uh, also try to do work and stuff. But uh, I think anyone who's a parent will understand. Okay, next. Uh, hey, Sipprins, today I'm curious. Are you going to do another Christmas special this year for your next upload? I enjoyed the old TV commercials you did last time. <laughs> oh, I'm glad someone enjoyed that anyway. Uh, yeah, maybe I will. Maybe I will. You know, to be completely honest with the uh, lack of sleep and the, the hectic schedule of everything that's been going on, I mean, Seamilk and I had to work so hard to finish that Worthless Whips episode that uh, I'm running a little behind. So my video tomorrow is uh, kind of up in the air. So maybe I'll just do something cool. Anyway, let's continue. I think it's time we continued with the show. I've been talking for far too long. Like I said, Seamilk's not here, so let's see. We're back. And now hey, it's time Ooh, for it's our awesome. next segment, which is, of course, Worldview, where we talk about everything in the world and usually re related to China. Yes. So we're back. Worldview this uh, week is an interesting one, isn't it? What are we doing? 
<laughs> worldview today is uh, is about your favorite place in the world, your favorite comparison in the world, and that is Australia. Oh yes, okay, fantastic. Uh, a subscriber of mine, mm -hmm. I believe he's Chinese actually. Mm -hmm. uh, he lives in Melbourne. Okay. He uh, noticed something. He noticed that a lot of the like seventy five percent of the students that he sees are from mainland China. Yeah. And a lot of them are female. Mm -hmm. And the tuition is incredibly expensive. It can be like up to like 19000 Australian dollars per semester. Yeah, right? It's crazy. Now, most of the people going there are already super rich for a die, second generation rich people, right? Sure. But there's going to be a subsect of people that like, they got, the, they got into the university, but money's a little tighter, right? Yeah. Yeah. And because prostitution is legal in Australia... Is it? It is. Okay. Um, there are hordes of WeChat advertisements with QR codes and stuff telling you how much they are, per night, what they do, age, height, all that kind of stuff. And it's a relatively new phenomenon to see mainland college girls becoming prostitutes to pay for their tuition. So okay. that was interesting because like, you go to most places around the world, even if money's tight, most girls are not going to turn into prostitutes to pay you know, for college. You know, you say it's legal, but I, I feel like it's not legal to be an, a foreigner, a foreigner working not. on, you know... That's something to look into. Uh, on Australian soil. I know... Australia already belongs to China, so maybe it's a moot point. But the, sure. the fact of the matter is, I'm pretty sure it's in violation of your visa policy. Because Probably. if you're a student, you're allowed to kind of do uh, part-time work, aren't mm -hmm. you? There's a certain amount of hours. Yeah. You know, uh, this this is kind of a it's a dis disturbing topic to talk about. Prostitution, well, at, at least in a lot of the places around the world, it involves extortion. It mm -hmm. involves human trafficking, that kind of thing. But we also have to acknowledge just how prevalent prostitution is in mm -hmm. China and how much a part of Chinese culture it is. Mm -hmm. um, and anyone who's been to China will know this because wherever you go, you get prostitution advertisements slipped under your door in hotels. They're lying on the streets. You can literally go walk downtown. You'll see prostitute mm -hmm. adverts stuck on posters mm -hmm. lying around. We've got plenty of footage and proof of that. If anyone ever wants to try and call us up on that, um, it's, it's all there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that you notice everywhere Chinese businesses go. In Africa, they're constantly busting these brothels mm. and stuff that are set up inside Chinese restaurants and things like that. It's just a part of the, the culture. So I suppose in a way um, for them to be able to legally do this mm -hmm. and make money, um, yeah, why not? And I mean, the local authorities, again, in Australia are going to be so um, naive and uh, unaware of the situation because this is all on WeChat. Mm. And this is how a lot of the, remember we talked about the, the cheating mm -hmm. that the, they do in Australia as mm -hmm. well. It's because they're basically putting ads up everywhere in Chinese with Chinese QR codes that link to Chinese apps. Local people aren't going to do that. They're mm -hmm. not going to go scan it and figure out what's going on. Local people, if they saw those ads, they might think it's just some kind of Instagram or something. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't know that it's just blatantly like advertising right. prostitution, you know. So it's something I think that... Uh, people need to wisen up to and see mm -hmm. what's going on you know um and uh i mean i have no i have no issue with prostitution it's just the way that it's the the scene and the crime that surrounds it in china is different so it makes yeah. it different right and that's one thing i find quite odd though like if you are an american citizen and you go overseas and you engage in um activities that are illegal mm -hmm. in america mm -hmm. it, surely that's something you can't do probably not i mean like how are you gonna get caught though well, you're advertising online. Right. I see what you're trying to say. I mean, like, let's right. let's just say, what what's very illegal in America? Uh, <laughs> selling people. Okay. <laughs> All right, selling people. So let's just say you go to a country, let's make up an imaginary country mm. in the middle of nowhere. Uh, everybody's green there, okay? So you go to this green people country and you put ads up online. I'm going to sell people. Mm -hmm. And everyone in the world can see these adverts. Um, what, what makes you think the Chinese government cares that these girls are prostituting themselves? Because it's so I illegal in China. Everyone gets away with it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's there, it's in your right. face, but they keep touting how, like, um, pure and... Right, the thing that concerns me is that maybe these ones in Australia, even though it's legal there, maybe they're being run by triads from China it's too. Entirely possible. You know, because the triads were sending in beggar gangs. Yeah, Why that's right. Why can't they send in prostitution gangs? That's very true as well. Yeah, maybe, like, sending them in... As students, it's mm. just a guys. Maybe, because it's expensive. Yeah, so maybe what they do is they get rural girls and they set them up with fake documents and mm. stuff. 
because there's a huge racket for like them passing TEFL tests and stuff, you know. And so we're, we're going, we're going down a rabbit hole here at the same I, time. I'm like, starting to think that no, this is I'm a real thing. Think, this too. is a real thing. So they're probably getting them in as students, setting them up as like high paid prostitutes for all the, the Chinese people that live there, the other Chinese students, the Chinese businessmen. Actually, the, I think a lot diaspora. of the, I have the ads, so yeah. you can pop them up in yeah. this edit. Sure. Um, I think some of them are in English, bro. Oh, okay. Interesting. Either way, um, just something to let you guys know. So let's uh, switch to our Q&A section. I'm so. going to go back to Boston. Okay, you go back it's to Boston. Pleasure. Yeah, dude. Thank I, you, guys. I will take care of it from here on out, and I'll, uh, I'll see you when you get back. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so now we're at the final segment, which is just me answering some questions. So uh, let's quickly get straight into it, guys. Um, <clears throat> let's see. How do Vivi... How do you and Vivi do Xmas sea milk, trad or? Well, you're asking the wrong person. I'm not sea milk, so I know that uh, sea milk and Vivi are, you know, in Boston doing a family thing. So I guess it's kind of traditional. Um, for me, this I can answer for myself. For me, this will be the first Christmas that I can finally do something traditional uh, with my wife because. In China, it's actually kind of difficult to do a traditional Christmas because it's not a holiday, right? So everybody's still working. And um, getting a turkey is super difficult. You can do it. It is possible, but it's expensive and it's difficult to do. I used to have to actually smuggle a turkey in from Hong Kong every year. And I, I made a point of trying to celebrate Christmas in China because when you're in China, uh, of course, it's always the Chinese holidays and, and Chinese festivals, which is correct. I mean, it's China after all. And you, you see that all the time and you take part sometimes, you know, things like the Chinese New Year. It's very difficult to take part unless you're part of a family because it's a very tight knit sort of family thing. Um, but Christmas is just kind of looked at as a, a little commercial thing. You know, it's not taken very seriously. So I used to always arrange for the foreigners I knew to come around, you know, close friends, I should say, to come around. I'd get a little Christmas tree. I'd make sure there was a turkey there. Everybody get drunk. It would be some eggnog, you know. But um, this time around, I can finally have an actual sort of a family Christmas with my wife and my new daughter, who's less than a month old, and my parents-in-law. So it's going to be kind of interesting. So, yeah. All right, let's see. You're the best. Thanks for making us all smarter. Thank you very much. We're very happy to help. Um, obviously, what we try to do is, uh, as much as possible, just bring some some of our knowledge and experience to all of you out there. And hopefully it helps you out. Understand China a little better. All right. <clears throat> uh, Innocent Bison. I think this is pre-recorded. Best way to prove it... <laughs> prove it's not is to put your shoe on your head. No. I won't put a shoe on my head, but I'll put Kirobo on my head. There we go. That's Kirobo. By the way, if you want to find out about uh, Kirobo, he's our uh, he's a little little star in our Worthless Whips episode one, and he's going to be a part of the show. Uh, for those of you who don't know Worthless Whips yet, it's our new channel. It's about cars. Uh, just search it on YouTube, Worthless Whips, and uh, I'll make sure it's in the description later. Um, basically, we're starting a new thing. Sea Milk and myself, we've always had a passion for cars. It's awesome. Can't wait for you guys to check it out. The channel is there. The channel advert is up and a bunch of random Q&A videos are up on that channel for now. If you could go watch them to build up our watch time, we'd appreciate it. But the first episode is done. It's ready to be released. We're just waiting for the channel to be monetized because it's taken us months to put together. So we want to, you know, it's it's been expensive and time consuming and months of work. So we would like the channel to be monetized before we release the first episode. I hope you guys understand. But if you are a patron of either Worthless Whips or myself or Sea Milk, uh, we've already released the first episode for our patrons to to watch. So I hope you, if you are a patron, you have watched it because we can't wait for your feedback. All right. Um, there is another super chat here, but I can't read it by Daisy Glanville. I can't read it. It's doing that stupid thing where it doesn't snap down. So maybe if I scroll up through the chat, I'll be able to see it. Give me a second. Does that stay in the chat anywhere? Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. What's your opinion of Brexit and Boris Johnson? 
My opinion of Brexit is can can they just make up their mind, shut the hell up and either do it or don't because I'm tired of hearing that word. It sounds like a breakfast cereal, you know? Anyway, <laughs> uh, do we have any more Super Chats? If not, I'm just going to answer a couple of uh, chats out of the, you know, uh, out of the general chat here. Yeah, that's, let's see what we can find. Mm. Right, what do we got? Congrats on the new baby. Thank you. I'm I'm hoping that uh, our worthless whips takes off, by the way. Seamilk and I have put so much into this. And the first episode doesn't even cover what we've filmed and done so far. We've got so much, so much in the works. It's freaking fantastic. I really can't wait for you guys to check it out. Uh, and even if you don't like cars, if you enjoy the banter between Seamilk and myself, it's it's going to be a treat. We, we get up to all sorts of nonsense. It's really funny. <clears throat> Let's see. Um... Mm. I'm trying to find a good question here. Can you spoil why you chose the name Worthless Whips? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll tell you the concept of the show if you're interested, guys. Um, basically, there's this thing. When you're young, when you're a young man, this is, you know, not. I don't know if it pertains to young women, probably not, but when you're a young man... Uh, having a cool car is something that's a very high priority. At least it was for me, it was for Sea Milk and most of my friends. And you, you want to have a cool car because you want to be able to be a man and take take girls out on dates and, uh, you know, drive around and feel cool in your awesome car. So the thing is, when you're a young man, uh, you can't afford cool cars. It's just not possible unless you're some kind of, like, rich kid. Um, so what do you do? Well... That's what our show is about. We want to show people how you can buy cheap cars that are actually cool and fix them up very cheaply by yourself. And um, it's it's just the fun of going out and finding these cheap cars and and showing people how to fix them and doing some tests and and seeing if we can flip them that kind of thing. It's uh, it's it's not as formulaic as you think though. If you watch it, it's got a lot of quirks and and it's a little different. It's something that uh, Seamilk and I have been coming up with for quite a while now, so cool. Um, uh, L.E. Munzo, what's your dream car to own one day? A 1971 Plymouth Barracuda. Or I'd settle for a 1970 or 71 Dodge Challenger as well. It's almost the same thing, but the front grille of the 71 Cuda is absolutely my favorite. Um, and that's my dream car. I've got another, I got a couple other like minor dream cars, which I'm sure you'll see during the series because um, unlike most people, my dream cars are not very expensive. Unfortunately, the, uh, the, the Plymouth Barracuda or Dodge Challenger, because there's some kind of a weird um, bubble going on with muscle cars these days, they are expensive and that's out of my grasp for now. I guess that's why I call it a dream car, right? But uh, I've got some dream cars that are cheap, so we'll see. I mean, yeah, let's move on. Thanks for the question, though. <clears throat> uh, let's see. What's your impression of St. Louis, Missouri? I actually enjoyed it. Uh, I had great barbecue there. I flew the drone. Uh, <laughs> I flew the drone over the arch. Uh, that was during my 2016 trip, and that was hairy. That's, that was incredibly hairy. I'll have to tell you guys about that one day. Um, <laughs> all right. What else have we got here? Any more? Okay. What about doing a road trip in Europe sometime in the future? Absolutely. Guys, we have so much on our cards. And that's something I actually want to reiterate here is that just because we've got this new Worthless Whips channel on the way, it doesn't mean it's going to take away from anything else we do. You see, uh, we're trying to expand, not contract. So we're going to continue with the China videos, continue with the podcasts, continue with the ADV China. Remember, ADV China is kind of um, one of our favorite things to do where we get to travel around Asia or wherever we go, ride motorcycles and talk and kind of have a, a thing. And it, it's it's an adventure, right? So that's always going to be there no matter what. And our own personal channels will be there too. And this Worthless Whips is just a, an extension of everything and, and trying out different things, trying to follow, uh, you know, sort of a passion that we both have for cars and seeing how that goes because uh, we just love doing that kind of work. And if, if you guys appreciate it and if you actually enjoy it, it'll be incredibly satisfying for us to, you know, pursue that and uh, do that more. <clears throat> 
All right, see what else we got here. There is another super chat from innocent bystanders who has better tasting cars, you or sea milk? Well, that's up to the audience to decide because that's stupid because obviously I have better taste for myself and he has better taste for himself. But I'll tell you what, it's a, it's a funny situation because I love American cars so much and that probably has a lot to do with the fact that we didn't get them in South Africa when I was young. Um, even now, you know, other than pedestrian stuff like... Uh, Fords and stuff um, and when I say Fords we didn't even get Mustangs or anything we just got the usual rebadged Mazdas or whatever so um, it'll be interesting to see through the channel we'll answer that for you uh, okay Mass Effect which ending Winston um, I kind of stopped caring about the endings um, when Mass Effect 3 hit I really enjoyed Mass Effect 3 but the ending I just kind of ignored it I uh, so yeah, I love Mass Effect, but they kind of lost the plot there. And uh, let's see if we've got something else here. Has anyone else noted, seem, noticed, Sea Milk, Prozzi, Serpent, ZA? Coincidence? I think not. CIA. <laughs> yeah, you found out our secret, didn't you? Didn't you? <laughs> um, oh, okay. Finally, uh, Jimmy FZ, thanks. SCMM is Southern California Motor Meetup. Well, that'd be a great thing for us to do for the new channel. So we'll look into that. Thank you for uh, putting that on our radar. Um, okay. And uh, Chad Hurst says, I would like to see you guys do a 986 or 987 Porsche Boxster on Worthless Whips. Also do A and it's cut off because it's doing that stupid thing again. And I can't actually read what you said. Well, you know, we're all open for suggestions. In fact, we've got polls going on right now. Um, oh, there you go. Also do do a deep fried turkey for Christmas. It's the only way to make turkey. Inject it with spice and dip that effer in lava. Do it. <laughs> okay. Never thought of that. Um, I'm not actually sure what I'm going to do because it's up to me. And I'm not a good cook or anything. And I'm going to have the in-laws and stuff over. And suddenly I have to come up with a traditional uh, Christmas dinner. So I'm just hoping that... I could somehow get a pre-cooked turkey somewhere otherwise i'm i'm gonna mess this up so bad um okay cool well guys it's probably time to wrap this up i want to answer one more question if i can from the um just the normal ones and uh let's see if i can find one here okay um well switch and lever asked any plans to go back to south africa and riding around to be totally honest with you um if if I do go back to South Africa, obviously I'll be filming a lot and I'll be riding around or driving around a lot to show everyone. But um, if I never go back to South Africa in my life, it wouldn't faze me. Um, I have no love for that country, you know. And when I say the country, again, not the physical country, obviously, the, the government and, and the way society is headed. Um, and I think that's probably... Oh, we get one more super chat. You just stopped me. Okay. Can you share a little bit of your experience being a new father? What has surprised you the most from Doubting Thomas? Um, nothing has surprised me. You know, this is something that actually annoyed the crap out of me. Everyone's like, oh, you're not ready to be a father. You don't know what it's like. You know, it's going to change your life. It's going to be this and that. And no, it's exactly what I expected. You get a cute little baby. They kind of all look the same in the beginning. Let's be honest. Like you can... Take my kid and another kid that's just been born, put them next to each other. You couldn't really tell much of a difference. Um, obviously, as they grow, they, they become more cuter and you get more attached. So you get a cute little baby. It's helpless. I have no idea how the human race survived, to be honest, because babies are just like so fragile. It's really easy for them to just expire. So you have to keep this baby alive. That's your whole thing. And that includes cleaning, disgusting diapers. Ah, oh, the one thing I wasn't prepared for is this like first week or whatever, the, the, the first amount of poop that comes out. It's this weird black tar stuff. Look it up. It's absolutely disgusting. Anyway, so you're changing diapers. You're getting very little sleep because it cries when it's hungry or when it's uncomfortable or when it needs this and that. So I was expecting all of that. There's nothing that, that surprised me. So... To be honest, being a father is exactly what I expected it to be. So it's no big deal. It's it's awesome, though. Um, not going to lie. It, it gives you a great feeling of accomplishment. And um, 
I think that's something that most people don't talk about is the fact that uh, once you have a child, it does give you a different perspective on life because you you do lose a certain amount of selfishness because before the kid's born, it's kind of just all about you and perhaps you and your um, significant other's relationship and so on. But once the kid's born, priorities do shift and you do start to see how important it is to bring a child into the world. So I guess maybe from that point of view, things changed a little bit, but otherwise, yeah, it's awesome. You should give it a try. Nothing wrong with being a parent. And uh, it's always going to be a challenge. It doesn't matter if you're financially stable or not or what situation you're in. Having a kid is something I would recommend, at least if it's your choice. All right, <clears throat> guys, I'm going to have to honestly uh, wrap this up right now. I want to say thank you so much for coming along on this rather odd um you know, podcast. Seamilk and I are busy trying to coordinate. As you know, he's in Boston at the moment. We may have to skip the next one, depending. If we can figure out a system that works well, where he can call in and we can have our podcast live um, the next one, but it's going to be like on the 2nd of January or something. It's kind of New Year's. Everyone's going to be hungover. So we're probably going to give it a skip anyway. But we'll let you know. So don't worry, stick around. We'll make a little announcement on the channel or, or something. But it will only be one week that we skip, if we do. Um, and uh, everything else should just continue as normal on all our other channels. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you on ADV China and, of course, on Serpents A Day and Lawa 86 um, in the coming weeks. And I want to wish all of you guys the very best for the holiday season. It's time to celebrate. It's time to spend time with family. Um, whether you believe in Christmas or not, it doesn't matter. It's an awesome time of the year. And uh, I wish all the best to all you guys out there. So thank you very much for watching. You know, um, this is uh, it, it's, it's a great... It's a great honor to have such a fantastic audience as as you guys, to be honest. You know, you, you're what keeps us all going and uh, the reason that we do everything we do. So until next time, you know the drill. As always, stay awesome. And I'm not going to cut myself off this.